Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth and Sue, for the invitation. My name is Professor Tara Spires-Jones from the University of Edinburgh. I work in the UK Dementia Research Institute and the Centre for Discovery Brain Sciences. And I'm really excited to talk to you today a little bit about the current research going on in neurodegenerative diseases. I can get my slides to, to work. Here we go. So what I'll talk about today, and as Ruth mentioned, I'll leave plenty of time for questions. So I hope you're thinking of good questions for the end. But briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about the healthy brain and how fantastically amazing it is, what neurodegeneration is, and how genes and lifestyle factors contribute to neurodegenerative diseases um, and some of the brain changes that cause disease symptoms. And finally, I'll spend a few minutes talking about how science translates into hopefully life-changing treatments for these diseases. So we'll start with the healthy brain. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, so this is my favorite part of the body. If I, probably the fa my favorite part of the universe, really. So your healthy brain, you've got a picture of it here. Um, and this is a picture from the side of a brain that's been dissected after someone has died. If you cut through and you make a coronal section, which is through the brain this way, then you can start to see some more of the structure. You can see that the beautiful folds in the brain are the gray matter along the outside. And then inside the brain, you've got white matter, which is the, the wires that connect the brain cells. The gray matter is where the brain cell bodies live mainly. And the white matter is the axons, the wires that connect the different parts of the brain. And one of my favorite fun facts is the white matter of the brain is white because of the fatty insulation on these wires that let your electrical connections in your brain happen. So it's just like the insulation along the wires for our electrical cables, except it's made of fat, so it's white. And then if we look in even greater detail, these are drawings of um, microscope sections by one of the founding fathers of neuroscience, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. So in the very late 1800s, micro microscopes were very new and silver staining of brain sections was very new and Cajal stained sections and drew neurons, which are absolutely beautiful. So the, the, the kind of cells that do the talking in the brain are these neurons. They're the ones that send the wires through the brain who make the network and allow us to think. And you can see they've got a beautiful structure. They've got dendrites, which receive signals. They've got axons, which send the signals through the white matter. And where the axons and the dendrites talk to each other, where the neurons communicate, is called the synapse. This is a little electrochemical connection point. This part here, this is an actual electron micrograph of a human synapse. This is the presynaptic terminal, so that's the end of an axon. And you can see it's got all these little circles in it. Those are filled with neurotransmitters. And when an electrical signal comes down the axon, these neurotransmitters release their, ner these little vesicles release their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft here. And that neurotransmitter binds to a receptor here on the postsynaptic density, which is on a dendrite of another neuron. And that starts off another electrical signal in the next cell along. So those are where your brain, uh, how your neurons talk to each other. And one of the amazing things about the brain is how complex it is. So you have about 100 billion neurons in your brain and about 100 trillion synaptic connections. And for reference, that's more synaptic connections in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy, which I think is phenomenal. And it's also one of the reasons why it's so hard for us as neuroscientists to find out what's going wrong in diseases like Huntington's and dementias and then find ways to fix it. So what is neurodegeneration? Neurodegeneration is the loss of neurons. It's the progressive loss of the structure and function of those neuronal cell bodies or those neuron cells that do the thinking in the brain. And lots of different conditions cause neurodegeneration. Dementias are the most common, and that's what my lab works mainly on today. But as you're all well aware, there are also diseases which are predominantly motor diseases like Huntington's disease. And really anything that damages your brain badly enough in a chronic way can cause neurodegeneration. So stroke can cause neurodegeneration prion diseases, multiple sclerosis, brain tumors, and brain injuries. So I'll talk some today about dementia and some about Huntington's disease. So I thought for this audience, probably everyone knows what these diseases are, but I'll do a little bit of a definition of dementia since this is an HD group. Dementia is an umbrella term that uh, covers a range of diseases. It's sort of any disease that causes the set of symptoms of progressive cognitive impairment. And the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which I'll tell you about a little bit because we work on that in the lab. But there's also vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and as you're all probably very aware, Huntington's disease also can cause cognitive symptoms and cognitive decline and dementia symptoms. 
dementias as a whole group of diseases are of huge uh, relevance to the world in terms of the disease burden. So these numbers are a few years out of date now, but it's just a nice graphic, so I still use it. It's estimated that about 50 million people worldwide are living with some form of dementia today. And these numbers just show you sort of the, the scale of that across the world. In 2015, that was over 10 million in Europe, 9 million in the Americas, 4 million in Africa, and 22 or 23 million in Asia. And those numbers are getting worse because the biggest risk for dementia is age and our population is aging, which is a good thing. We're living longer and not dying of other things like heart disease and cancer quite as much because research in those conditions has really worked and come up with life-changing uh, treatments or preventions. But what causes neurodegenerative diseases? So for most neurodegenerative diseases, it's a combination of age, genes, and lifestyle factors. You will know from Huntington's disease that there is a causative gene for Huntington's disease, but I'll talk a little bit today about how you can modify the onset of the, the disease by looking at these other, uh, in particular, lifestyle factors. But one of the big knowledge gaps in the field of neurodegenerative disease research is we don't fully understand the biological links between these risk factors and the brain changes that cause disease symptoms. And that's something we actively work on in my lab that I'll talk about today. So what happens? You have these age or genes in the case of Huntington's disease or lifestyle factors that cause changes in the brain. We don't really fully understand how, but we do know what happens to some extent. We see protein aggregation or clumps of protein that shouldn't normally be in the brain, clumping up in the brain, either in the cells or outside of the cells. And we also, of course, see this neuron loss, which is the neurodegeneration. And common to almost all of these neurodegenerative diseases is also an early synapse loss. So those connections that I told you about between neurons seem to be very hard hit early on in the disease. And together, the brain changes, of course, cause the symptoms that you notice, the motor changes, the tip decline. So I'll talk a little bit about genes in terms of the causes of neurodegenerative diseases, because there are some neurodegenerative diseases that have causative genes. So you know Huntington's disease has a 100% penetrant, means if you have a gene expansion of longer than 40 repeats or so, you will definitely have Huntington's disease. Parkinson's disease, which is another common cause of neurodegeneration, is usually what we would call sporadic. It means you didn't directly inherit one single gene that caused the disease, but there are about three to 5% of people with Parkinson's who do have a single gene mutation that causes their disease. Similarly with motor neuron disease or ALS, there's a pretty substantial proportion of people with this disease who have a causative mutation that's been identified in their families. Frontotemporal dementias can have disease causing mutations. And in Alzheimer's disease, they're very rare. They're somewhere between one and 5%, but they do exist. There are a few genes that can cause familial forms of Alzheimer's disease. And I don't want you to go away knowing all of these gene names. I just put them up in case you were interested. But of course, the one that we'll talk about today is Huntington's, the Huntington gene and the CAG repeat. So the Huntington's, Huntington gene, as you're probably well aware, has a trinucleotide repeat in it, a CAG repeat. And all of us have this. If you have 10 to 26 of these CAG repeats, you're totally normal. If you have 27 to 35 or an intermediate length of, of these, you're sort of what we would call intermediate length, 36 to 39 repeats, you're likely but not guaranteed to have Huntington's disease. And over 40 repeats is full penetrance, which means you will have the disease in, the, in your lifetime. If we look at not genes that cause the disease directly, but genes that increase your risk for having a certain disease, we know these are also very common throughout the different neurodegenerative diseases. So in Parkinson's disease, about 5% of people are thought to have a, a gene that increases their risk of the disease. It's not a guarantee, but if you get the gene, you're more likely to get the disease. Similarly in ALS and FTD, and in Alzheimer's disease, there's a very large proportion of people with the disease that we think have some genetic contribution. It's not a guarantee, but having a bad combination of genes, living to a late age and having a combination of environmental factors that we'll talk about seem to work together against people to cause these diseases. And in Huntington's disease, having the repeats will cause you to have Huntington's, but recently there have been identified what we call modifier genes. So similarly to the risk genes I was just talking about for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, et cetera, there are genes that you can inherit that change the age of onset of Huntington's disease. And they can change them either way. They can make the onset happen earlier or they can make the onset happen later. And this is a paper I wasn't involved in, I'm giving you a lot of background now, 
but this was from the Genetic Modifiers of Huntington's Disease Consortium, and they've published a couple of papers now that were really strong. And what they showed is that you have a really an individual variation in your age of onset. So if two people inherited the same repeat length uh, for Huntington, one might have the onset a bit younger and one might have the onset a bit older. And there are some genes on different loci that are, we would say, good because they push this to later ages, and some we would call bad alleles because they push the onset of the disease earlier. And when they looked at this, this meta-analysis, so this was a study of lots of different genetic analyses that the authors and their colleagues ran. They looked at the age of onset and the genes from over 9,000 people with HD. And they found chromosome four has the Huntington gene, so of course that's associated with, with risk and age of onset. But they also found on chromosome three, on chromosome five and on chromosome 15, oh, so three, eight and 15, a few genes that were robustly associated with the delay or acceleration of disease onset NHD. And a lot of these genes seem to be involved in DNA repair. So this is some really interesting science that are giving, giving us hints about how we might be able to change, hopefully delay the onset of Huntington's disease by perhaps increasing the activity of some of the protective genes. But it's a long way from being a treatment for people at the minute. We also know, sorry, I thought I turned off my email ping, so I'm sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> we also know that lifestyle factors affect neurodegenerative diseases, and this is particularly important for the dementias, which I'll talk about because we do a lot of research on this. So we think that about one third of dementia cases could be prevented by changing modifiable risk factors, which is massive if you think about the 50 million people worldwide who have dementia now, if we could have changed the risk factors, risk factors we could reduce that number by a third. It won't surprise you to know the things that are associated with increased risk. These are mostly things that we would try and tell people to avoid uh, no matter what, but smoking is associated with increased risk, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, being sedentary, social isolation, depression, and hearing loss are all also associated with dementia risk. Associated with reduced dementia risk, so things that are probably good to reduce your risk are exercise, a healthy diet, level of education, so well done for coming to the webinar, this is helping your brain, and keeping active both physically and socially. It's important to understand when you see association studies like these that they're important and they're, uh, they're very well conducted. They look at tens of thousands of people generally, but what this kind of epidemiological study cannot do is prove causation. So for example, I'll take here depression. So there's an association, people with depression are more likely to also have Alzheimer's disease later in life. But we don't know from this kind of study whether the depression is part of the cause of Alzheimer's disease or whether the depression is an effect of early Alzheimer's disease changes in the brain. So when you hear stories in the news about things being associated with disease, keep in mind that it takes a lot more than an association to prove whether that's causative and also to prove whether we should be chasing that to, to try and develop a treatment. But there was a paper out this year, if you're interested in these dementia risk factors, which is one of the best sort of overarching look at the whole field for risk factors for dementias, and it's in Lancet Commissions. Um, and they came up with sort of a strategy for modifying lifestyle factors to prevent dementia or reduce dementia risk. So if you're interested in more details, I would highly recommend that paper. So lifestyle factors can potentially also modify the age of onset in Huntington's disease. This is much less well established than the lifestyle factor data for, for Alzheimer's disease, but there is some data suggesting that exercise training in people with HD is safe, but whether or not this can slow the progression or delay the onset is still quite inconclusive. But I thought you might be interested to hear that research is going on actively in this area. I've put two quotes here from two papers that, again, I've put links in, in the talk that is recorded, so you're very welcome to go and read up if you're interested. Uh, but these two quotes are suggesting that physical activity is positively correlated with improved cognitive and day-to-day -day functioning and possibly motor functioning in individuals in prodromal and early phases of HD. Uh, and here's another quote showing that physiotherapy and or personalized exercise programs might be beneficial for overall function in HD in people living with HD. And that's actually made it into guidelines for the treatment of Huntington's disease recently that were published um, in 2019. And here's a little bit of data from the 2016 paper showing that uh, cognitive function, when the number up here is higher, that's a good thing, is positively correlated with your Fitbit activity score. So this line going up from the left to the right is showing that the more active you were, the more likely you were to have good cognitive function. 
And conversely, the more active you were, the less, uh, the lower your disability score was in this study. So as I say, this isn't hugely robust data yet across thousands of thousands of people, but I think it's promising and worth further research that lifestyle factors could be a potential modifier in Huntington's. Another even earlier or more sort of pilot set of data is suggesting that um, gut microbiome is changed in Huntington's. And this could be just a marker of the disease, which could be a promising marker for people to look at and track people, for example, in trials, but it could also be an indication that there's something to do with lifestyle in your gut microbiome that might affect uh, or modulate Huntington's. So there's new data suggesting that there are changes in the gut microbiome in, in Huntington's disease people. This was just published this year and it's only 19 people. So it's not a huge, not a huge data set, but here's a graph showing motor signs and the amount of one type of bacteria, the abundance of one type of bacteria. So the less of this particular bacteria that people had, the, the um, higher their motor signs were. And the total function capacity had a slight correlation with, with this same kind of bacteria. So it's a little bit of data, but again, I thought you might be interested to hear the cutting edge research. Uh, there's also, so, so highlighting the importance of gut biomarkers potentially, a biomarker is just something that we can measure that might be reflecting what's going on in the brain or in the nervous system. But again, I wanna emphasize that this is early days, this, this that will need replicating. Uh, these aren't my data, but I thought they were really interesting. So now we'll talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease and the brain changes that uh, go along with this type of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease was described by this, this person, Alice Alzheimer, in about 1907 about his patient, August Dieter, who came to him and said, I lost myself. And she had the classic symptoms of dementia. She couldn't make new memories. She was confused. She had behavioral issues and she declined very quickly because she had, a, we think, a, an early onset form of dementia. And when he looked at her brain after she died, Alzheimer observed three things that we still use today to neuropathologically diagnose Alzheimer's disease. These are uh, atrophy, and atrophy just means brain shrinkage, so loss of the neurons. And you can see that comparing a, a slice through a human control brain and someone who had Alzheimer's disease, you can really see how much smaller the Alzheimer's brain is. And hopefully you can also see I'm pointing with the pointer here to this little hole. So that's the lateral ventricles, the ventricles which are normally in the brain, but they're expanded in the Alzheimer's brain because the tissue is shrunken so much. And this little curly bit of the brain it's called the hippocampus, which is very important for learning and memory and is very degenerated in Alzheimer's disease brain. Um, when you look down the microscope, Alois Alzheimer described using the same silver stains that um, Ramonica Hall used, that you have the accumulation of two kinds of pathologies that he named plaques and tangles. Plaques are made of amyloid beta that accumulates in the neuropil, so not inside the cell bodies. And tangles are made of tau and they accumulate inside the cell bodies. But these pathologies also, uh, you can, if you look down the microscope, you see both the plaques. Now I've just drawn a cartoon here of this, the plaques, the tangles inside the neurons, but you also see this accumulation of lots of other types of brain cells called glia, which are these sort of innate immune system of the brain. They're, they become inflammatory and they're attacking, first of all, the pathology, but later on they become toxic and also damage the brain cells themselves. And these pathologies accumulate over time, very slowly because it's a long duration of disease. So this is the amount measured in the brain and age on the x-axis. So if we look at the neuron numbers, for example, we don't see those going down until you have what we call mild cognitive impairment. That means you can detect cognitive change. But long before that, you have the ramping up and accumulation of these plaque pathologies, the amyloid pathology, in the phase that we would call prodromal, which means we can't detect any cognitive changes at all. And when you have this amyloid beta going up, you start to see a little bit of a loss of synaptic connections, and that loss gets steeper and correlates very closely with the cognitive decline. In fact, of all of the changes in the brain, the loss of these synaptic connections correlates most closely with the dementia symptoms. In Huntington's disease, it's another neurodegenerative disease. So of course there's neuron loss, there's neurodegeneration, and that's particularly evident in the basal ganglia and the cortex. Um, excuse me one second. Sorry, it's half term here. I don't know if you can hear my kids shouting, but I just asked them to stop. <laughs> so you get this neuron loss. You can see this is the, what we call the basal ganglia of a normal brain, which is nice and plump. But here you can see it's shrunk 
And again, the ventricle is expanded because in Huntington's disease, many, many of the neurons have died in that part of the brain. And also in the neocortex, which is why we have cognitive symptoms as well as motor symptoms in Huntington's disease. And when you look down a microscope, you can see again, there are protein clumps in the brain, but this time, instead of being plaques and tangles, these are inclusions of Huntington protein. So the little brown dots that I'm showing you here are inclusions of Huntington in neurons inside the striatum. And we also know, similar to Alzheimer's disease, that there's altered synaptic function. So those connections, again, are very important in the disease process. What we think is going on, and this is a review by one of my colleagues at UCL, Sarah Terbrizi, who's also in the uh, Dementia Research Institute, is we think that expanded Huntington gene is made, being made into a protein that has this expanded glutamine tract. And the protein not only clumps in the cells, but it affects the cell function. It affects the synapses, it affects the power houses of the cell, the mitochondria, and it affects moving things along those long wires that are needed to keep the cells healthy. And it involves changes in the expression of lots of different genes. So there's a lot going on downstream of this one mutation in Huntington's disease. So that was all sort of what's known from the broader field. And what I'll talk about for a few minutes is are a few studies that either I did in my lab here in Edinburgh, a bit of the work that I did when I was in Oxford with Tony Hannon and Colin Blakemore. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of Tony's current work uh, because I think it's a bit exciting that you might like it. So in my lab, we've been looking at how these these lifestyle and genes, so these risk factors, affect the brain. And in particular, I'm really interested in these synaptic connections because they're very important for thinking. New synapses are important for learning and memory. The function of your synapses are important for all of your brain function. And we know that the loss of the synapses in Alzheimer's tracks very closely with the symptoms. So we had a hypothesis that the toxic clumps of protein that you see in the brain could be directly affecting the synaptic connections. And I had two fantastic PhD students, Robert Kofi, when I was still at Harvard in Boston, and Ellie Pickett, one of my first PhD students here in Edinburgh, who both looked at this question and found that indeed, right around the big amyloid plaques, there are soluble toxic forms of A-beta that we call oligomers, which just means instead of one would be a monomer, two would be a dimer, and a few is an oligomer. So oligomers of this A-beta peptide that's normally in plaques clump up not only outside of the cells, but inside individual synapses. And I'm showing you here a picture of the plaque stains with lots of different antibodies to stain the A-beta and presynaptic terminals and postsynaptic terminals. And you can see right inside them, we developed a special technique that allows you to see inside of synapses. And as you get closer to a plaque, you have more synapses that contain this oligomeric A-beta. We're also showing that risk genes really influence this. So there's one of the risk genes that increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease about tenfold. It's called ApoE4. And ApoE4 exacerbates or makes worse the synapse loss in Alzheimer's mice. And it makes worse the accumulation of this toxic A beta within synapses. And this is work that I did in collaboration with a colleague in Boston, Elise Hudry, who showed that the loss of synapses around plaques, when you have the bad version of the gene, ApoE4, is much higher than when you have the gene, the version of the gene ApoE2 that actually protects from Alzheimer's disease. And this was again in a mouse model of disease. Still in mice, if we knock out ApoE, we can protect completely against the synapse loss. So ApoE is the risk gene. If we remove the ApoE, we prevent the synapse loss. And this was done by another fantastic PhD student, Rosie Jackson, and a master's student, Claudia Canavo, in collaboration with Eloise Hudry again. So we had mice that were normal mice, mice that didn't have any of the ApoE, mice that had plaques and mice that had plaques, but we'd knocked out the ApoE and we showed a rescue of the synapses. And then importantly, what I've talked about those last few slides was in mouse models and our mouse models aren't perfect and they're certainly not people, but we've adapted the same technique called array tomography for use in human brain. And Robert and I had a look in human Alzheimer's disease brain and showed that we can see, again, this accumulation of the synaptotoxic amyloid beta around plaques inside individual synapses, and here's one here. We showed that there's loss of synapses around plaques like we saw in the mice uh, in human brain, and also that this loss is worse in people who have the risk gene ApoE4. And further, the people who had the ApoE4 risk gene had a huge amount more accumulation of the toxic A beta within their synapses. So we're linking one of the risk genes for Alzheimer's disease to one of the things that correlates most closely in the brain with symptoms. 
Another risk factor for Alzheimer's disease called clustrin is a protein that's quite similar to APOE. And recently with Rosie Jackson, we saw a very similar picture that clustrin also clumps inside synapses alongside the toxic oligomeric A-beta. So now we've linked two genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease to synaptotoxic proteins in human brain. So we think that one of the ways these genes increase the risk of dementia is by driving this toxic protein to the really important synaptic connections in the brain. We also look a little bit at lifestyle in my lab. So a PhD student, Anna Stevenson, who's just finishing up, who's co-supervised by Ricardo Marioni and Ian Deary in the psychology department, has been looking at links between lifestyle and inflammation in the body and cognitive decline with age. So we have a really fantastic cohort of aging people here in Edinburgh called the Lothian Birth Cohort 1936. These people all took a cognitive test, an IQ test at age 11, because interestingly, the Scottish government thought that kids were getting stupider as families grew. So they tested this by giving every Scottish school child a, an IQ test and their hypothesis was wrong, but they gave us some wonderfully useful data because they did this twice. They had two sets of, of thousands and thousands of kids taking IQ tests. And Ian Deary recruited a, a couple of thousand of these people in their seventies to participate in aging studies. And when I arrived in Edinburgh, I was uh, really lucky that we were able to start recruiting people uh, to donate parts of their brain when they die, which is really an amazing gift for us. And Anna was able to look at data from the blood of hundreds of these people in the cohort. And what she saw is that as people age, markers that indicate that they had inflammation in their blood, a chronic inflammation, not like just a cold, but long-term, you have more inflammatory proteins in your blood, go up as the people aged. And what we also found is that the, the, the sort of estimated brain age, you, you know your chronological age is how many years you've lived, but you can look inside the cells at the DNA and see if they're, how markers of cell aging look in different parts of the body or the brain. And in our case, the part of the brain really important for memory that I showed you that really degrades in Alzheimer's disease called the hippocampus had an accelerated brain age compared to other brain regions. And that same part of the brain had more of the microglia, which is one of those inflammatory cell types that I told you clumps in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients. So what we're seeing in this study is that markers of DNA changes caused by systemic inflammation go up when you age. It's, this marker is also associated with smoking and high BMI. So that's like further lifestyle, not just getting older, but lifestyle to brain changes. And it's associated with poor cognitive skills during aging. And we're starting to see hints that this is associated with more inflammatory changes within the brain. So we're starting to really go deeper into how lifestyle factors like smoking and obesity affect the brain to cause cognitive decline in aging. And I mentioned those little microglia because I talked about synapses and then I talked about that inflammation study just now, and now we're trying to link the two together. So Maka Sioris, a current, current PhD student, is looking at those little glial cells called microglia, the inflammatory cells in the brain. And what he has shown is that microglia in Alzheimer's disease brain are eating synapses. They contain synaptic proteins. Now microglia are supposed to eat stuff. They're supposed to go through your brain and eat any viruses or any toxic proteins. They should be clearing this amyloid uh, plaque that's accumulating, but they get less effective of, is that, at that as we age. What they're not supposed to do is be eating functional parts of the brain like your synapses. And what Maka sees is that the purple microglia here contain green synaptic protein. And this happens an awful lot around the blue amyloid plaques. And this is a little 3D render. You can see a blob of a microglial lysosome that contains some of this synaptic protein. And when we looked at lots of different people's brains and two different brain regions, this happens on average more often in AD patient brain compared to control brain. So we're starting to link these synaptic changes, this degeneration of synapses and amyloid caused synaptic degeneration with inflammation, which is what Anna is looking at in aging. And this experiment is really interesting. So this was, again, we're so lucky. We had people donating small pieces of their brain at death for our experiments. We've also been able to work with some neurosurgeons and take bits of brain from people who are undergoing surgery. So this is people who are having surgery for epilepsy or brain tumor removal. So they would be having the surgery anyway. But normally when the surgeon goes through and takes out the tumor or takes out the part of the brain that causes epilepsy, they go through a little bit of healthy brain that they normally throw away. And instead of throwing it away, these patients have allowed us to take tiny pieces of it and grow it in the lab. And what Marcus was able to do is grow living microglia from human adult brain and feed them synapses that we isolate 
from Alzheimer's disease brain from postmortem tissue. So this is really, really interesting. And what we saw when we feed the microglia human synapses is that the microglia eat Alzheimer's disease synapses more and faster than synapses from control cases. I don't think I have a movie in here. I do have a movie of these cells, but I don't think I put it in this presentation. So to shush Iggy, to sum up our Alzheimer's disease research before I go on to a little bit of Huntington's research, what we're showing recently in our lab is that genes, age, and lifestyle are contributing to synapse degeneration via both the synapse toxic amyloid beta and through this inflammatory neuron glia interactions, we're calling it, this sort of systemic inflammation. And this is where the lifestyle seems to be coming in, is by modulating the inflammatory parts of the brain. So now I'll talk a little bit about Huntington's disease, which I'm sure you're all very interested in. When I was a PhD student in Oxford, I worked with Tony Hannon and Colin Blakemore. And just before I came, they had published a paper on environmental enrichment. And they showed that if you give mice who have a gene, who have the Huntington's gene within expansions, or R61 mice or R62 mice, and you expose them to an enriched environment, it's really good for their brains. So there's, can you tell it's half term? <laughs> and there's no child care during the pandemic, yeah, so sorry. apologies. So this is an example of an enriched environment. And so you see the mice, they get a running wheel, so that's exercise, they get a lot of friends to play with, they get a lot of toys. And what this does is it gives them exercise and motor stimulation, cognitive stimulation, sensory and social stimulation. And what Tony and Anton found before I arrived in the lab is that when you do this to, to HD mice, you substantially delay the onset of the Huntington's phenotypes. So this is exactly what I was talking about earlier with the human exercise studies, which aren't, aren't hugely robust yet, but it's clear at least in mouse models that lifestyle changes can delay the onset of disease symptoms. And this is very robust and reproducible in lots of different studies around the world in mice. What I found as a PhD student is that one of the things that this enrichment does is it protects protein levels in Huntington's mice of something called BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor. So when we enriched the mice, they had more of this protein purely in the cortex. This is the, the neocortex. And this is the enriched version. So when you're not enriched, the Huntington's mice have a loss of this protein. Oh, sorry, this is striatum. When you're not enriched, the mice have a loss of this protein when they have the Huntington's gene. When they are in the enriched environment, it goes back up to above normal levels and they're just like their wild type or normal sibling pals. And this goes along with rescuing some of the brain volume that you see. So this is the same brain volume right around the striatum. And in the non-enriched Huntington's mice, this goes down, but in the enriched Huntington's mice, it's maintained at the wild type level. So this is a little bit of evidence from mice again, that changing lifestyle or environment can change the, the brain in a way that will help delay the disease. And my love of synapses actually started as a PhD student and started in Huntington's disease. And this is one of the first studies I did. We were looking at these Huntington's mice. And what we showed is that in the mice, we see a loss of dendritic spines, which are the postsynaptic density. So we see a loss of synapses if, from the wild type compared to the HD mice. So synapses, again, seem to be very important for this process of neurodegenerative diseases. And they're also very able to be modified by environmental factors. So this is some data that's not from our group, but it's from, uh, I believe this is from some of Tony's data. And we saw that they saw, not we, synapse function is boosted by enrichment in Huntington's mice. So enrichment was able to selectively enhance the gene expression of a serotonin receptor. So this is a kind of synaptic receptor and the functional consequences on behavioral uh, pharmacology. So this is showing you, this is the EE would be environmental enriched. And you can see that, that the HD mice uh, have rescued rescued uh, levels of this protein when they have the environmental enrichment. And then finally, I talked about the one study that has observed changes in gut microbiota or gut bacteria in Huntington's disease. And Tony's lab has recently looked in mice and, in, and again in the same mouse model at the gut microbiota. And he sees that these are altered in HD mice. And again, this is maybe a good biomarker or maybe a potential indicator that you could modify your diet or your inflammation status or your exercise to modify your gut bacteria perhaps. So here's an example of a couple of different types of bacteria showing changes between the wild type mice in black and the Huntington's mice in white. 
So here's the research summary for Huntington's disease. We know the Huntington gene expansion is causing synapse dysfunction and degeneration, neuron death, and this is what leads to the impairment, the functional motor and cognitive impairments. And what I talked a little bit about today is we know that repeat length can change the onset of your uh, Huntington's disease symptoms. I didn't really go over that. It's very well established that the length of that repeat can change the longer the repeat, the earlier the onset in general. But what I also showed you is that there are some other genes that can change the onset. Enrichment and exercise, there's a little bit of data suggesting this might be able to change the onset. And there's still no evidence, but some hints that gut bacteria might be involved somehow in this process. So I wanted to end uh, the research part of the talk on therapeutic outlook. And you probably, I don't work actively in the Huntington's field very much anymore. So you're probably more aware of this than I am. But one of the things I'm very excited about is the group at UCL led by Sarah Tabrizi doing an antisense oligonucleotide trial. So an ASO is, ASO is antisense oligonucleotide. And this is a little sequence of RNA that matches a little sequence of the Huntington RNA. It's sort of the opposite, uh, sort of the sort of opposite, so it matches up. And what the ASO does is it lowers the levels of the Huntington in the body and in the, and in the brain. And what they've showed recently in this clinical trial is that in the CSF, Huntington is decreased in a dose-dependent way with this ASO treatment. So this is very promising because this is attacking right at the heart of what causes the disease, which is the gene expansion. So this is still in trials. We don't know for sure whether this is going to be um, helpful, but I have high hopes. Uh, and I'm really crossing my fingers because a similar drug, a similar ASO worked really well for a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a horrible childhood form of motor neuron disease. And ASOs have been able to maintain the life and the function of these children really, really well. So I'm hopeful that this drug or some of the things that we've talked about today will develop into life-changing treatments. So that's my take home message is that neurodegenerative diseases are caused by genes and in many cases, environmental factors or lifestyle factors. And in terms of dementia is also age being the risk factor. Synapses are important for brain function and they degenerate in these diseases. And I hope you'll take away from this that we really need more research in order to understand these basic biological links between risk factors and disease in the brain so that we can really crack this disease, these diseases and develop treatments and preventions. And I'll leave you on a note of hope that research does work. We will find these. And we think about cancer that was a death sentence many years ago, and now many kinds of cancer have effective treatments. Not all, but there's been progress. HIV AIDS is now a chronic disease that you can live with and doesn't kill you, whereas it was, it was really horrible uh, and a death sentence many years ago. So if we do get the appropriate funding and keep the smart people coming in and interested, we can do this. We can defeat these diseases. So I will end by saying thank you to my group that's here. And I have to give a special thanks to Tony Hannon, my mentor, whose data I presented in Huntington's because he still works very actively in the field. And a very special thanks to our patient donors and, our, and their families, because without them, we wouldn't be able to do this research. <laughs>